But you know, today I, I'd love to start from the top. Uh, what is uh, Genalysis and what is the origin story of it? Yeah, it's it's a good question, and I always love to tell the original story. So, so uh, before Genalysis, as you mentioned, I was at Kraken uh, in the crypto exchange in San Francisco, and I would say saw some parts of the early industry. I would also say I've been in crypto for for as you say more than ten years, and in the early days of of the crypto industry, and um, you know. We were all curious about how to build a great company in crypto, how to be famous, how to do the right things, and so on. And to be honest, the only thing you could really build in the early days in the crypto space was was um, was exchanges, because you needed people to get access to the crypto space. Very much analogy with the internet. Initially, the only thing you could do was provide people access, and you could build some content. But basically, you want you wanted uh, access to, to to crypto. So building the rails from from a bank or from a credit card process and other things to buy crypto and get exposure to this new new uh, magic internet money. Uh, that was basically what you wanted to do. So uh, looking at that, then um, we also heard a lot of rumors about it being abused for criminal activity, people could buy drugs, there were rumors about terrorist financing. There are a lot of other things happening in the early days. So um, at the same time, uh, working further on at, at Kraken and looking at like, how could we set up shop in Japan? How could other things happen was, was an important part talking to regulators in Japan, talking to, to banks all over the world, uh, I, I kept hearing the same concerns. How do you do transaction monitoring crypto? How can we even understand the origin of funds? How do you even assess how much is being used for various, for various purposes? And how can you even get like some level of transparency into this cryptographic uh, like trend, value transfer system? And I think with some of those things, I started to think and, and suddenly realized that the answer to this was hidden in plain sight. All of the transactions on a blockchain are freely available. They are, they are on the blockchain, there'll be billions of transactions, but the challenge here were to understand how to interpret them. What was actually going on in the blockchain? And, and then thinking through that, I said like, okay, can you build an algorithm that can somehow uh, give a, an image or picture or, or map of the blockchain that will enable people to understand what happens here and enable you to build all kinds of data you can want on top of that. So that was really the core uh, challenge that I tried to solve initially. So fast forward, we then built uh, the biggest database in the world of connection between real world entities, being exchanges, darknet markets, everything that you can find in the crypto space and digital identifiers on the blockchain. So you have a transaction and immediately you know who sent it or received it. And that is kind of the basis foundation for everything we build following that. And, and everything on top of that is then the products. And, and it's like, what, how do you monetize data? You do it through products and products can be investigation, compliance, and so on. So uh, f fast forward to today through this origin story. So when you say the blockchain, do you cover the, the Bitcoin blockchain? Do you cover all blockchains? Uh, do you, uh, does L1 versus L2 make any difference? How do you think about it? So, so I think about it the way that we cover everything. The, the only right answer to this is basically everything. It doesn't mean that everything is like there as, to, as of today, but if it's not, it's there tomorrow or it's, it's in, in, in the pipe of, of, of happening. Uh, of course, there's a little bit of lead time between the genesis block of a new, of a new pro uh, token project and when we have it in our product. But in principle, everything is supported from the onset. And, and that's, the, that's the focus there. For me, it's everything that moves on public blockchains is something that we, we have support for in the product. Okay. And uh, so you mentioned having a, a database where so you keep a record of, uh, of, of what exactly, because it it's, must be absolutely uh, gigantic. Like how, how, do you, it, it, how do you store and manage and query a database of that size? Yeah, it's, it's actually a good question. The best way to think about it is that, well, you have all of the, all of the transactions in a blockchain. Well, they're kind of storable because by definition, someone has to store them. Otherwise you can't really build a, a proper node in a blockchain network. So all of those are storable. We keep them stored in S3, like have a lot of, of, of data around that. And then for each single transaction, we store metadata. What have we figured out about that transactions? And then, then all of that information is available and we, we build, continuously build uh, that on top of that. So think about that as a one big spreadsheet where it says transaction from blockchain, uh, sent sent maybe by to maybe two, and then we build out a big a big uh, database of that. And then on top of that, we can now run different queries. We can aggregate to say what is the biggest exchange. 
how many transactions did it send? How much did it send last week? Are people moving funds into that exchange and moving fund out of that exchange? And of course, because I'm a, such a big fan of like machine learning and AI, I cannot resist asking the question. Is that so? Is that like like a, like a bunch of like uh, SQL queries in a database, or do you have like no. presumably you have a lot of machine learning to identify we, patterns and? Yeah, we do. So basically, what happens over the years again, like if you build this sim simple algorithm, is this transact two transactions done by the same others? Well, you can create something, and then suddenly you get a signal, and you have something that looks about right, uh, but of course, it's not precise. And, and you can take the analogy to, to the page rank algorithm that Google invented initially. Of course, it kind of worked initially and we were all happy about it because it was better than Alta Vista, but it was not really anything that was, was, was amazing. Basically in early days, we, we had a simple algorithm, improved that over the years by getting access to, to ground truth data. And then once we, we used that, we could optimize the algorithm. And then when we look at the data today and run the same algorithm on the data, it's like several hundred times better because you just have all the training data uh, worked with customers and law enforcement to get access to that. And suddenly we have, uh, have a very good uh, understanding of, of, I would say, what's happening on, the, on a blockchain. So from my notes here, I see uh, this uh, channel, this is business data, this KYT, this cryptos with a K, uh, marketing detail and reactor. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a whirlwind tour through the various products and what they do? When, once I had like the first, uh, database and a backend that kind of work, you could run different queries, but you, you soon realize that if you try to sell that to anyone, they're like, I don't know what it looks like. I need some, some UI in front of that. So uh, building Reactor was the first uh, input here. So basically visualizing the map of the blockchain. So Reactor is, is um, the way that we sell it today. And what I would call it is like an investigation or enhanced due diligence product where you, um, for example, can look up an, a, a transaction and immediately you would see this is the entire wallet from that service. Then you can follow another wallet and say, how did they interact with each other? And there might be other, other wallets that you want to understand how are they interacting. You might have a lead in a, in a case. If you're talking law enforcement, there might be a specific lead and they want to follow the flow of funds until they find, ah, that's actually early days. The same person, our target here, used a crypto exchange in, uh, let's say, Slovenia, and we can reach out to them and ask what what's the identifying information of the person and suddenly you figure something out. So that's, uh, that would be an example of, of a use case for, for Reactor. It's also being used for enhanced due diligence in, in a compliance setting and just for people to click around and trying to understand what is crypto actually about. So that's, that's Reactor. Then uh, in 20, around 2018, we launched KYT and KYT was launched as a reaction seeing several crypto exchanges having hundred of accounts of Reactor. They were basically going through all transactions above a certain amount and try to understand what happened. But that doesn't really scale when you move to, to millions of transactions, you can't investigate all of those. So we created KYT as a transaction monitoring um, capability where, where all transactions are screened and then only those who show any kind of, um, I would say suspicious behavior either in structuring or it could be interaction with darknet markets or illicit sources, other things, then we would surface that to the compliance person and they, they would run it in Reactor and figure out what actually happened. So that, that was the KYT piece. Uh, the other thing we saw was a need from, mainly from the established uh, financial institutions. If they wanted to bank a crypto exchange or, or other crypto service business, they I kind of asked at a high level, what are they doing? And then we said, well, if we aggregate a lot of data and try to build cohorts around it and so on, then they can say, oh, this customer that approached us now, they're actually the second biggest exchange in the Netherlands. They have customers typically uh, getting amounts of $200. That's, that's the amount they're selling and trading. And uh, that's what, and they're using them, by the way, to, to do online ga gambling or maybe a gaming service somewhere. And suddenly they got a good, I would say um, helicopter view of, of, uh, of the crypto space that made it comfortable for them to provide banking services to, to, uh, to the different players in the space and also just understand what were business in, in crypto doing. So that was cryptos. Uh, then moving into um, to the business intelligence piece uh, and the market, market intelligence, let's start with that one. Uh, market intel is very much around some of the stuff I mentioned before. You want to assess what is going on in the crypto market today. 
are, are people we see the price go up or we see it go down? What is the reason behind it? And if you look in the in the tea leaves of, of the blockchain, you will, for example, find examples that, oh, the the small investors, they are, they are trying to sell and liquidate their assets because they need liquidity right now. So we will see a lot of small transactions moving into crypto exchanges. But we don't see any big transactions going into crypto exchanges, so we don't see any whales leaving the space. So that means that we expect that the market movement will be temporary. And there's a lot of similar things that you can assess from, from that. You can also say, oh, China is liquidating all the assets, but it doesn't happen in Europe. So we know that the price movement comes from China, for example. So these things can we can assess from the data. And that's, of course, of high interest from regulators, of high interest from investors into the space to understand what is going on. And then the final piece is business intelligence, where using the same data just to understand what are people doing on your platform? Are they, for example, are they also playing other games than the game that you're providing? If you're looking at that space, are they buying other NFTs? What is going on there? That's business intelligence. That's again, like using the same data for another, for another use case in, in a company. Fascinating. Hey, can you talk about some uh, fun examples or fun stories? I, I know that there's only so much you can talk about uh, and some of the users of the platform are, are, are you know, very confidential, but like anything you can talk about, about like, you know, uh, fun stories. Yeah, I, I think there's there's uh, there's a couple of, couple of those. I, I think it's always tempting to grab some of the the law enforcement stories because they're always juicy and people always like to hear about it. But take for example, we had um, the Colonial Pipeline hack. We, we released a blog around around that one, how we collaborated with the FBI around FBI used our products to to basically um, figure out what what went up in that case. And and if I without going into in too much detail about what what actually happened there, but what what you can do is that you can you can identify, uh, for example, a ransomware payment. In this case, it was ransomware payment. You see what wallet it goes to. You see how it's being how it's being moved around on the blockchain after that, and you suddenly realize that that blockchain that movement is part of a bigger wallet. And now you know, okay, that wallet has been active before, and then you realize what exchanges have they sent test transactions to? Where are they intending to, for example, liquidate the funds? And you, you realize that there. Yeah. I have another fun story uh, that's, uh, that's way closer to home. This happened, I think it was um, between Christmas and New Year. Uh, my, my, my girlfriend comes to me and is like, hey, my Instagram account has been hacked. So someone is, is uh, asking for ransomware payment for giving her account information back. I start chatting with him. He wants to, uh, to get paid uh, $1,000. I negotiate it down to $700. Uh, I have found his email address being used in other, in other hacks. I run, I run this to, uh, to Reactor and uh, realize what exchanges that he's using. I understand where in the world he is. Can reach out to these exchanges that are customers of Genalysis and ensure that these accounts get frozen. And uh, then when I pay him $700, then I, I already know that I'm, I'm sending them to an account that's frozen already. But it's very, very hard to find the law enforcement agency that wants to run that case because for them, it's $700. And I can't approach anyone and say, I got $700 stolen in Bitcoin. And they're like, okay, what? That's not interesting. So that's just another example. Uh, what we are trying to do in these cases is, of course, to find, okay, is present the entire size of the case and go to a local law enforcement and, and sell it to them and say, this is actually something that could be solved. And this could make the life a much better for a lot of people if you, if you went after this case. So that would be another example of, of, uh, of stuff happening on the blockchain. What, what, where do you think we are in terms of like traditional financial institution getting into the space? What are you, what are you seeing? What we've seen over the last two or three years is like two, three years ago, we saw some of the payment processors and neobanks becoming very interested in crypto. Uh, we've seen that from, from Square, they became Block, so they obviously become very interested in crypto later. And we saw it from, from Robinhood, we see it from PayPal. They want to, to kind of do something in the crypto space. And it's kind of typical, you see the newer player in finance, probably uh, grabbing, they, so they grew a lot from, from just like, doing finance on the internet in the early days. So they clearly see that this new technology and that can probably uh, grow their, their wallet share among, amongst the, their customers even further. So they entered the space and had a lot of appetite for that. Today it's become like a core part of the revenue for many of them and clearly something that's important. So that's like for all practical purposes, you would call them crypto businesses. Um, then what happened a little bit more than a year ago were that 
um, some of the more traditional financial institutions, they, they saw the same. They saw that crypt, the price of crypto were growing, the adoption were growing. A lot of the high net individuals that were using their private banking service, they would, would ask them, how do I store my $10 million in Ethereum? Ideally, want to store them in your bank, but you don't provide cust custodian services in crypto. And then we saw an influx of, um, of enabling custody on traditional file institutions. So I would say we are, we, are, we are where I would say a lot of financial institutions have become crypto businesses and many of, most of them have a plan to become it. So that's where we are in the adoption curve there. What are your thoughts on the current uh, you know, NFT gaming, like all those spaces, are, are they relevant to you? Is that something that you think about? Yes, I think the way I look at this is, um, and, and others have made this analogy before, but comparing the in growth of the internet with, with, with what happens in the crypto space. In, in the early days on the internet, there, there was not really much to look at. And uh, then at some point, a lot of content sites started to appear, Web2 started to become a thing, and suddenly we got like at the real growth of the internet happening. I think that when you look at NFTs, when you look at gaming platforms and other things, you actually have content on, on, on the blockchain for the first time. So that's the first time you really see a use case that's inherently tied to the digital world. Before that, it was basically investments into the underlying asset and were driven from, from speculative or investment purposes. And now we clearly see this, this trend that, um, that people want to buy an NFT, play a, play a game where the stakes are actually real money or the feeling of real money and, and the feeling of, of real rewards if you, are, if you are good at the game. And we are seeing that happening. So I think that they are extremely important for, for showing the future of, of the blockchain. And, and for us, it's the same. It's like being able to, to follow what happens on, on the blockchain and understand the growth of that industry. We've released NFT reports. We've done other things around the space. Understand how that space is growing and figuring out how we will data can help the growth of that space the best way and ensure that customers on on those services get the best possible journey in in uh, in for, for those customers uh, for those um, for those companies tell us about uh, what sort of what's next for the company so maybe starting with the product roadmap to the extent that uh, you can talk about it what, what are some of the things that you're building yeah i think uh, and it kind of it dovetails to the question you had before around nfts and others i would say when we looked at um, at the early days of crypto, everyone that was were a company in the crypto space were a financial institution. And now, as we said in the question before that, every financial institution is becoming a crypto company as well. But they're all regulated. They all need compliance solutions and so on. But if you now look at the next level of growth on, on the, in crypto around NFTs, gaming, uh, trading cards, uh, gaming and other things, they are not regulated businesses. They are basically just selling things and objects on, on, the, on, on, on the blockchain. And I think some of the things that they start to need and understand is to understand what their customers, how their customers are using their platform. And I think that's another area. And that's where we look at like the, the business intelligence side and understanding uh, the customer space there, where, where I, I'm very focused on that this year. And that's clearly something we see as being a core focus of what happens in Synalysis this year. And for, for the company itself, um, what's super interesting is that, um, you know, in a world like full of crypto projects and, and tokens and, and, and that type of thing. So you, ultimately, you're a B2B SaaS company, right? Or you're like a data yes. platform. So like, is the end game like, a, like a, you become a global, I mean, you probably are already like a global company. Uh, you do an IPO. Is, is, that, is that sort of how you think about it? The way I... I... I usually phrase that internally and think about it is that we are, we are in the process of growing up. We are right now basically trying to mature the company in various ways. We, we built a really great leadership team over the last year, have hired a lot of, of, of great execs there. We are, we are maturing the company in various ways with the right processes, the right structures internally and doing, doing all of that. We are more than 600 people this, uh, today and, and growing to more than 1,000 this year. So clearly in hyper growth mode, so my focus is basically trying to ensure that everything grows roughly in sync and we, we have like roughly the right assessments of, of where we should grow and then basically execute on this opportunity we have with how can we monetize uh, the data that we have in various ways and how can we best build products for, for, for the crypto space 
to uh, accelerate the growth of the crypto space, which has always been been the core focus of Chainalysis. All right, really nice. All right, just one last question from me. Um, so taking off your Chainalysis uh, CEO hat off for a minute and just like, you know, you, Michael, um, what, what do you think is super interesting in the crypto web three space these days like in like an area or project or company or you're like oh you know this is really cool like almost like i wish uh, if i was not doing this i'd do i'd do that type thing i think maybe a a, a pit project or, or something that I, i i really think is cool technology and that's a, that's the helium network i think that's an interesting network because it basically connects the real world with the digital world in a very nice way you can do things as as proof of location and other things that, that you can you can use and if you look at the adoption from a lot of iot projects and others they start to depend on helium and the things are being built on top of that and i think that's first time we've seen that in the crypto space where having crypto as a core piece of the infrastructure for how we are building other products in the world is is, is happening Okay, very cool. We, we we happen to be very early investors there, but I promise this was absolutely not planned. So thank thank you for like picking that one of, of all. Uh, cool. Thank you so much. Look, I'm I'm, I'm um, uh, you know uh, super grateful, and it's such an interesting story. Like we we had your co-founder Jonathan uh, at one of our events, one of our driven events back in 2018, and the company already had like a nice uh, velocity. But like it's really amazing what what you all like the 600 of you have achieved in the uh, you know, in the last few years. So I'm, uh, uh, again, grateful uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing the, the journey ahead. And, uh, you know, maybe you can come back in a couple of years um, and uh, as, a, as an even bigger company CEO and, and tell us the, the next uh, part of the journey. Would love to. Thanks. 